Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, hope you had an enjoyable lunch. I know that uh, the afternoons are that period where everybody is feeling a little, um, you know, maybe not as frosty as they did in the morning, so I will do what I can to keep things moving along here at a sprightly pace. Um, and here at the beginning, I'm going to be uh, talking about the second module, Your Leadership Philosophy. And just for time's sake, I am going to need to sort of curb discussion a little bit on this. Um, these are questions where discussion can go on for hours and hours, but I want to make sure we get to other material, which I think is just as valuable. And even with a somewhat truncated treatment of this, I still think that you're going to get the essential value behind it. So the word philosophy is not used in the world of leadership or the world of business very often. Um, it's not something that we've thought about for a long time. And uh, but I want to let you know about what I mean by the word philosophy. I would say that to me, and in this context, philosophy means worldview. What's your worldview? What's your sense of cause and effect? How do you believe the engines of the world and leadership operate? So there's, uh, um, William James says in one of his books that there's a, um, it's one thing for a, a, a landlord to know a tenant's income but it's another thing, and more important thing, to know that tenant's philosophy, meaning this person's view of the world and how they would conduct themselves and what right and wrong is, is more important to know their income. Patton, General Patton, is rumored to have said in the um, desert in, in North Africa after defeating Rommel, um, Rommel, you magnificent son of a bitch, I read your book. So in other words, it was more important for him to understand Rommel's tank engagement philosophy than for him to understand Rommel's numbers and that he was able to win because he understood that philosophy. So that's where I'm going to. And the reason why where, uh, philosophy is important is because it oftentimes governs our behavior way in ways in which we're not even really aware of. So I want to try to surface some of our assumptions, some of our world view some of our philosophy about what leadership is and how it operates to give you a little clearer sense of this and hopefully some insight into yourself and what might be driving your own behavior in these concepts. Finally, I'm going to talk about the concept of resonant leadership, which is going to make emotion prime in the leadership relationship. Okay. So here's a big question. Is leadership a quality of the person or the situation? Is leadership the force of the times, force of the individual, or force of the times, the zeitgeist, the German word meaning spirit of the times? Is it about the great man or woman, or is it about the big bang? OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for a show of hands. You must raise your hand once. You must raise it once and once only. So you can't raise your hands two times. We all know that the answer is both, right? The answer is both. But we lean a little bit one way or the other. We lean a little bit toward the person or the situation. We all do. So I'm asking you to raise your hand which way you lean. How many people to this question would believe or state that leadership is more, a little more, about the individual? And how many about to the situation? Okay, all right, fairly even balanced, a little bit more for the individual. So what I'd like is a very brief conversation about why. Let's start with you people that said you felt it was more like about the individual. Why? What experiences or insights or, or, um, or, uh, uh, or speculations do you have about that? I just feel like a lot of times if the leader is well established, um, as you've seen in you know the news many times, leaders go from one company to another where they don't have the specific technical uh, ability from one company to the other. You can change industry and sectors and, okay. and different continents and still have the ability to lead given a totally different situation. So okay. it's the person that has the knowledge and the wherewithal to perform. Okay, very good observation. Others that would uh, go along the same line. I just think when multiple different situations, you kind of see the same common people. If you have a group of uh, a group of people, you'll have the same 
in different situations, the same person kind of jumps to the head, um, meaning he has you know the initiative to kind of take the lead uh, to. Um, kind of push the people in the direction that he sees fit. Okay. It just kind of feels like that's more of a characteristic of who he is, he okay. or she is. Okay, you're almost talking about the qualities of the people and that leaders have certain qualities, they're gonna take, they're gonna be assertive in different situations, they might even create uh, leadership opportunities proactively, and therefore that you locate the causality more in the individual. Okay, good. Other thoughts, either side, situation or individual. I would just return for a second to the Giuliani, uh, Queen Elizabeth conversation, okay. thinking about those were both situations where there was an opportunity to lead and we saw leadership or a lack of leadership in a way uh, through those personalities. I think that situ some situations will always uh, offer maybe uh, an additional opportunity to lead, but ultimately okay. the person has to be the one who brings okay. forward those qualities that are needed. Okay, so the situation is what needs to be led and then, or, or prefers the opportunity to be led, but an individual has to decide to do it, and the two have to be compatible, the situation and the person. So, good. All right. Others, especially from those of you that felt it to be more along the, um, uh, the line of, uh, of the situation. Yeah, so situation, you brought up Winston Churchill earlier. I think he's a pretty good example that he was probably, some could uh, say he was probably one of the best leaders that this world has seen in the last you know, 500 years. Uh, but once the war was over, he pretty much dropped off the line and he wasn't reelected. Interesting, and he's exactly right. Um, so what are you saying? If there weren't that situation, there wouldn't have been Churchill. Okay? I mean, it would have been Churchill, but we never really would have heard about him, right? I mean, he'd been very important. Uh, um, uh, head of the Admiralty, uh, Minister of the Admiralty, other roles he'd had, a great diarist, a great historian, all sorts of other things. We wouldn't remember him for this had it not been the situation. So in his mind, the situation is prime here, that you've got to have the situation before you can have leadership. Okay. I just counter, I think, wasn't Churchill then brought back into office? Uh, you should, the, the, the clarity behind here is, I mean, he was the perfect prime minister for the war. He was voted out after the war because they didn't need a wartime prime minister, they needed a reconstruction prime minister. For essentially nostalgia's sake, he was brought back in in the conservative party for a year and a half before they were, uh, they were ousted again. So it was kind of like, oh, we miss old Winnie, and he came back in and he was still the same Winston Churchill he was, and they said, no, that's not really what I need. Churchill was an interesting case of somebody who was incapable of being himself skillfully. He was just himself. Um, there was nothing else he was capable of doing. One of my favorite quotes of his is um, he was asked by the parliamentary barber how he liked his haircut, and Churchill's response was, in silence. <laughs> Don't talk to me. Um, that's the way I put my haircut. Um, so pretty irascible man himself. So you're right, he was voted back in, but again, more for nostalgia's sake and for a very short period of time. I think an individual is not a leader unless there's a situation. So you can't, uh, unless there's a situation, you can't show your leadership. Okay. That's basically you know. Okay. All right. And I, I think that that's a perfectly legitimate point. It, the situation has to be there for somebody to lead. But an, in, but an individual has to possess certain qualities and traits in order to lead. Think about people like General Patton. Okay. He inspired an entire army <clears throat> to act, and it was a World War II, I want to say. So, I mean, I don't think anybody could have just stepped into that role. You have to have those qualities and have that demeanor okay. in order to uh, follow through or execute right. what you need to happen. Absolutely, and, and consistent with the comments from over here are that they have to have the qualities. And those qualities are located in a person. They're not in this situation. Okay, it's the person that possesses those qualities. So the person's prime. You could see we could go on with this for hours, right? Okay, we could really dig into this thing. Let's let's get one more comment. Before. Again, I'm going to try to move things along a little bit more briskly here. But um, uh, but I think some qualities can uh, you can um, possess it when you like it's like like um, 
natural ability, but then some qualities you need, you can be developed. Like those qualities. They can't be developed. I mean, you can you can develop those you, qualities depending on the situation. I, I think that's true, um, but I'm going to speak exactly to that in a little while. Okay. Um, so I mean, the idea, the, the answer here is both. Okay, both are absolutely critical, but it's how both. And so what I want to do is spend a couple minutes here um, uh, explaining some evolutionary biology to you and try to use that as a basis by which we can understand this interaction of the situation and the person. And this is going to seem a little bit like I'm going way afield, but give me a few minutes and I hope to be able to bring it back. But let me start it with this question. Why is the giraffe's neck long? Everybody's looking around like, oh, that's a trick question. I'm not going to answer that. Because it has to be. Uh, okay, all right. I need a little bit more specific than that. So, uh, back over here, guys. Where's the. Um, I would say because it evolved, because its main source of food was located high up in the treetops. Okay. That's what most people would answer. Some variation thereof is because there's digestible foliage in the forest canopy for which there is less competition. Makes sense? That's why the giraffe's neck is long? No. It has nothing to do with why the giraffe's neck is long. I would say that over generations, the giraffes with the longest necks were most likely to reproduce. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. So everybody talks about Darwin. We use Darwin and evolutionary phrases all the time, right? Evolution, uh, you know, just the word evolution, and survival of the fittest, and, and spontaneous variation. How many of you have actually read the book, The Origins of the Species? That's what I thought. <laughs> so we use this to these terms and we throw them around, and yet nobody really knows what Darwin means, and you, don't, you can't know unless you read the book. It's a wonderful book, not particularly well written, but a wonderful book. Um, and uh, what Darwin does in here is make it clear, very clear, that there are two natural cycles of variation in nature. The first is what's called the cycle of production. And the cycle of production is that which produces the variation in a genotype and thus a phenotype of a species. This is what produces what's different about it. Okay? You might have heard this phrase, tendencies towards spontaneous variation. That all gene codes have this tendency to spontaneously vary for no apparent reason and having nothing to do with environmental circumstance. They just vary all of a sudden. And we don't know why these happen. Even in today's world of advanced electron microscopes, we have no idea why spontaneous variations happen as they do. We can make a bigger case about it, but specifically, we don't get it. Then there is the cycle of maintenance. The cycle of maintenance is that which selects for the variation. What's very important here to point out is that it is not that which produces the variation. The production of the variation is completely separate from the maintenance or the selection of that variation. So the environment, the cycles of maintenance, just another word for environment, post hoc selects for or rejects a genomic variation. This is what the term survival of the fittest, and of course most of us think that means survival of the strongest. Okay, not true. It means the survival of the best fit to environmental demands. And this is perfectly logical and observable. Now we can understand the giraffe's neck. Okay? Why it is that over a period of time that neck got longer and longer because they were more likely to survive. But the reason why the neck is long is not because there's digestible foliage in the forest canopy. The reason it's long is because of spontaneous variations. The environment simply selected for it. It did not create it. Very critical here. It did not create the length of the neck. It selected or rejected for it after it was produced. Let me give you one other biological example before moving forward. <coughs> Okay, 
this is a tree. Just pretend it's a tree. Okay? It's a tree, it's a birch tree, and there's a particular kind of moth known as the speak moth that would breed and feed around birch trees. Now the speak moth is white. I'm not even going to try to draw a moth now. Okay. Looks more like a lady moth, that's okay. All right. The speak moth is white. Now the advantage here is that the speak moth, this is its camouflage, right? The birds can't see it. Okay? But every once in a while, a speak moth would turn up to be black. Spontaneous variation, cycle of production. He would turn out to be black, and what happened to that speak moth? What happened to him? He got eaten, and he didn't get a chance to pass on his little black speak moth genes. But then, along comes the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> Soot spilling out of factory coal burning everywhere. Okay? Over a period of time, birch trees turn black in industrial England. So now, what's happening to the white moths? What's happening to them? They're getting eaten. Okay, because they don't blend anymore. What about that occasional black moth? He's got camouflage. He survives. He passes on his black moth genes. And within a single generation, this entire species of moth changed from being predominantly white to being predominantly black. Now, modern day, industrial scrubbers, offshoring, all the rest of it, the birch trees are back to being white. And so is the speaks moth. My point here is that in no case did the environment make the moth change color. That leaves in those trees made the giraffe's neck longer. In no case did that do that. The environment operates after the variation has been produced to select it or to reject it. What does this have to do with leadership? Come on, help me out here, people. Uh, let, let me go. I think the environment, like the work environment and the situation dictates the leadership traits that need to be, you know, acted upon. Okay, so we've got a fitness argument here, right? Your traits, your abilities have to be well fit to the environment that you might or might not be leading it. If it's not, the environment rejects you. <coughs> if, pardon? Doug Guthrie. Okay, you, we could argue that. That's not a bad point at all. Because I described Dean Guthrie as the qualities that he brought were not compatible with the environment of academics. Okay, so it's a very good, it's a, it's a very good combination, right? I mean, it's really a good explanation of that. So he was rejected from that environment. But what's very important is that the environment didn't make Doug Guthrie who he is. The environment does not make leaders. The environment selects for them. The environment chooses them or it rejects them. So our big takeaway here is that you, as a leader, are you a unique product of the cycle of production. Nothing can explain you, just like we can't explain spontaneous variations. That's what you are, you're a spontaneous variation. So many billions of things have happened to you in your life. So many billions of interactions with your own sensory systems and central nervous system. We cannot explain who you are. But we can explain why you were successful or unsuccessful in a given situation. By looking at your portfolio of skills and comparing that to the portfolio of needs that particular environment was uh, um, was experiencing. And this is what helps us understand Churchill. Right? There was Churchill with these qualities. Perfect for one situation, not for another. Okay? Um, and here's another really interesting part of this. If you do your job well as a leader, you change the environment to the extent that you get rejected by that environment. Churchill won the war. 
Now he's no longer relevant. By doing his job, he did himself out of a job. Okay? You see where I'm going here? If you change the floral and faunal equilibrium of the organization in which you work, you are no longer relevant. You've changed it. Time for you to go. Okay? It's time for you to move on. Um, uh, Jeffrey Reinhardt, CEO of PepsiCo, who, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be writing for my new magazine, he and I are working on a paper together called The Five-Year Cycle. And the point of the paper is leaders should, CEOs, should never stay in a job more than five years. Okay. Because if you haven't gotten done what you needed to get do in five years, then you're a failure, move on. If you have gotten it done, you should move on too. Because <laughs> you've changed the place in a way that your skills, your styles are no longer well suited for it. Don't we usually bring new leaders whenever we would like to introduce new change to the organization? Okay. And by that, they actually change the environment? Okay. Um, then I'm not sure I got your question right, but let me address it. One of the things that's different from us compared to migrating birds, giraffes, or speak moths, okay, is that we can be proactive in the environment. You and I can create environments that are compatible to our own leadership skills. That's what entrepreneurs do, isn't it? Entrepreneurs create situations that are compatible with their skill set. That's what it is. Okay. Their skill set isn't compatible with, with structured organizations, large organizations. They want this situation. They create an environment for themselves. The other thing that you and I have got is proactivity. So if we're not doing well in one job, our leadership capacities are not being called upon, we can change jobs. Okay? We can proactively identify a different place, a different environment, a different cycle of maintenance for us. So I think that what this does is it gives us a real nice way of starting to think about leadership and the environment and how they intersect. There is a false belief out there in universalism which says that the situation will create the leader. It'll create. Whatever the situation needs, it'll create the <coughs> leader for it. Okay? And I tell you, I don't buy it. Okay? I just don't buy it. We could do, use some very simple examples. If Churchill had died in the campaigns in India, would the Allies have won World War II? Now, a lot of people are going to say yes. Okay? That's the destiny argument. That's universalism. I don't know. That one guy made a difference, didn't he? A big difference. I talked earlier about how a unique individual he was and how he was completely unexplainable and yet exactly right for the moment. That one person was gone. History might be different. Entirely different. So the situation doesn't create leaders. It selects leaders. I mean, I'm thinking, let's take Bill Gates. What if Bill Gates hadn't flunked out of Harvard? Would we have Windows? Now many people say, yes, the iconographic interface was already underway at 3M and so forth. I don't know. By the way, we might have something better than Windows. Um, but that's not the point. Um, but uh, um, yeah, he was a genius at design, but more so at marketing. If he was out of this equation, I don't know whether we'd be better off or worse off in terms of a computing environment. That one person made a difference, and a big difference. So I don't believe at all that the situation creates leaders. It calls for leaders, and those are different things. OK, next question. Is leadership innate, or can it be learned? Does one have it, or can one get it? Now, by innate, I don't mean genetic or anything like that, you know, early experiences and so forth. There might be some genetic issues associated with it, and we're going to talk about a few of those in a moment. Um, but uh, so, you know, basically the question here is, is it learnable? We already gave you the answer to this question. Can you learn to be a leader? When I frame it that way, there's a little bit of hesitation. When I said earlier that leadership can be developed, but it takes time, everybody went, oh, yeah, I agree with that. Okay? Now that I'm asking you the question, can it be learned, I'm not getting that full response. That sort of, yes, absolutely. 
So, why can't it be learned? It's clear to me that some of you believe that. Why can't it be? <clears throat> Maybe because you don't have the situation to learn it from. Pardon? You don't have the situation to learn it from. Okay, very good. That you don't have the proper situation cycles of maintenance to help develop and bring out your leadership abilities. Good. Other things. How many of you think that you have to have it? Come on, let's see the hands. You've got to have it. All right. But see, everybody wants to think you can get it. <laughs> That's good news for you, and it's good news for schmucks like me. Um, or else, you know, I don't have a job, okay? But, you know, notice, by the way, we haven't defined what it is yet. Okay, we're going to get there. We're going to get there a little bit later on. So, I had a couple other, yeah. I was just going to say, I think, I don't think um, leaders, I think leaders are, not to say born, but developed, so to speak, throughout their lifespan, but I think individuals, it's not something you all of a sudden learn. You can learn how to improve your leadership skills and develop to be better for the situation, but I don't think you can actually learn to be a leader. It's okay. either in you or it's not. Okay, all right, fair enough. It's in you or not. Uh, what it is, we haven't gotten to yet. So I would say I would like to believe that it can be learned, but I think most of our examples of great leaders, you know, we don't know that, okay, Churchill sat through a leadership class and, and became... <laughs> oh, with many leadership classes, I'm sure. I'm sure. He spent a lot of time and effort. Yeah. Right. And that, that, I think that, like, I would want to believe it, but I don't, I don't have examples to okay. point to. Okay. I think that it comes from experience, from, you know, making mistakes throughout your career. That's how it's learned. So okay. it's not just sitting in a class or something, reading a book. It's okay. through actual experiences. Okay, so you're telling me that this class just isn't really going to be worth it for you? Is that what you're saying? No, but I but mean, you've got like, something to say to me. You're going to say, okay? I'm being around the bush. No, but it, it's more helpful. I don't think this is worth it. Yeah. This is going to help. But, all right, go out, get some experiences, okay? Um, okay. Uh, just to return to your comments earlier about, you know, you've been emphasizing skillfully so much. Mm -hmm. I feel like if we're going to talk about can you learn leadership, it's about learning how to, as, as you put it, be authentic, but be authentic in the right moments. And, and that's where it's learned is kind of how, how to, it's not learning to be a leader, but it's learning how to use what you have okay. to be a leader. Okay, all right, very good, very good. Briefly, very much like um, an athlete, right? I, I can get better at basketball, but I'm, I'm never gonna be Charles Barkley, I'm never gonna be Jordan. So I think there's a band of acceptability with her leadership, and, and I can make mine better, but I would love to be born like, like a Winston Churchill. That might just be a better way to start. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, good. Um, you guys, oh, do we have one more? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, you guys are exactly right, and uh, here's, here's what the data shows. And I know this because I published the study. Um, <laughs> that the best evidence shows that leadership skills and styles can be developed, but only when there is a strong motivation and will to change, right? You've got to want it. It's just like anything else. You've got to want this because it takes a lot of time and energy. It's a marathon, okay? So you've really got to want to run this thing, okay? But then only up to a point. There's a ceiling effect in leadership development. Okay, so here's person A. They start, here's time over here. And we'll just call this leadership here. Here's person A. They make all this progress and then they flat down. Here's person B. Starts higher than person A, comes up to here, and then flattens out. And then there's person C, who really goes up and is better than everybody else, but then flattens out a little bit sooner in the curve. Okay. So everybody's got this ceiling effect. Why? What? Why is there a ceiling effect? Why is it we can develop it, but only up to a point? I would say, going back to the environment, that once you've developed your leadership skills over the period of time, the environment 
is eventually going to change where your leadership skills are no longer either relevant or you've just reached the maximum capacity given that set environment. Given that situation, yeah. So and I'll just put this a little bit differently. Your situation no longer stimulates your growth as a leader. Okay. So your situation has become a little stagnant in terms of its ability to, um, uh, to entice you and instruct you in terms of your leadership skills. Absolutely, that's one of the reasons. What's another reason? I think it goes back to the environment. I think a lot, or just a lot of, you need a lot of outside resources. A lot of leaders that I've read about had mentors. I think even in the case okay. that he had talked about Dwight okay. Eisenhower needed that, okay. that general that he was uh, sent to report to and how much it helped him reach that next level, which right. in turn, you know, led him to more success. So okay. I think mentorship is, is very <clears throat> important to leadership also. So I think okay. a big part of this is you have to be taught once you reach a yep. certain level. Yeah, and I'm gonna just tie that back into the previous one and why your environment isn't providing that mentor that can help you continue to advance. Could you talk about it from an evolutionary perspective like it's just physical limitations? You know, we can only process so much information at one time yeah. and learn from it. Yeah, and I'm gonna put this a little bit differently. Different people have different leadership capabilities. And by capabilities, I mean your max. Some of us have more capability to be a leader, so we can grow and continue to go. But we reach our potential at a certain point, right? We've reached the top of our capability scale. We can't go any higher. That's all we've got. I still don't know what it is. Okay. You don't know what it is. I do. Um, but uh, So you reach your capability, you're done. You can't go any farther than this. Okay? Now the good news about that, by the way, is I think that most of us aren't even close to our leadership potential. Aren't even close to it. Maybe some of us reach it. Good for you. There's no shame in saying I got to the top. And maybe person C has more leadership potential, more leadership capability than person A. There's nothing wrong with talking about capability here. Now, I want to add one more reason for this. You're not motivated anymore. Remember I said you have to be motivated and you have, you have to have the will uh, to do this. Sometimes you're not motivated anymore. You get up to this level of being a leader and you say, good enough. <laughs> I'm done. i got other things I want to do with my life. I'm not going to continue to try to improve it. I'm effective in my environment. I like myself. I like the impact I'm having on other people. That's enough for me. I, that's enough for me. Nothing wrong with that to say that I, I maybe could go farther, I just don't want to. So we've got your environment not stimulating you, we've got an internal motivation, and we've just got the fact <coughs> to address that some people have more of it than others. So. I was thinking along the lines... I was thinking along the lines of, I guess, if you were sort of identified to be, you know, maybe having some leadership potential, but you're just not quite there yet, and so your organization or whoever is kind of developing you and giving you these kind of like a toolkit <coughs> to be a good leader, and then if you yourself kind of realize, like, yeah, I do have it, but they're seeing these holes in me, then maybe it can kind of put someone at a point that they're like, well, they start doubting themselves. Okay. That maybe I can't get all the way up there if they're putting me through all these leadership training classes okay. or okay. You know, however the development is. Occurring. Okay. And I think we're going to address that uh, next or two weeks from now. So I think we'll definitely get to that. Um, again, I just want to kind of move things along, guys. So sometimes I, I do that. Please understand it's not uh, that I don't want to hear what you've got to say. It's just that we've got some time issues here. There's one possible explanation from this that comes from William James. This is also in one of your readings from today from Abraham Solancic. This idea of once-borns versus twice-borns. Okay. Now, a once-born is someone who's born, and life goes pretty much according to plan, right? Always some ups and downs and stuff, but pretty much a linear progress. They have 2.1 children. They buy a house with a picket fence. They work 47 years. They get the gold watch. They retire in Boca Raton. Okay. Um, pr 
pretty much been a linear progress through life. A twice born is someone who's born and in their formative years of life, 12 years of age or below, they had an absolute tragedy befall them. The death of a parent, the death of a sibling, a disfiguring disease, where they were shattered. You see, the once born never really has to think about their identity because life kind of goes according to plan. The twice born has been shattered. This was not supposed to happen. All their assumptions about the world, about good and evil and fairness are gone. They've got one of two choices at this point. To borrow from the Shawshank Redemption, they either get busy living or they get busy dying. Okay? That moment either destroys them for the rest of their life or they put themselves back together piece by piece, restore themselves, and now are twice born. Leaders come disproportionately from the ranks of the twice borns. Read leadership biographies, you will find that in the early life of the majority of them, something horrible happened. Something absolute horrible happened that devastated them. Okay? And they were able to put the pieces back together. Now, what might something horrible happening to that happened to you when you were a child, what qualities <clears throat> might that impart that could contribute to your ability to lead later in life? Um, okay. Yeah. Resiliency. Okay, resiliency. Good. That was my okay. Uh, persistence. Persistence. Okay. Humility. Humility. <clears throat> Adaptability. Adaptability. Big one. Self-awareness. Self-awareness. Who I am. Actually, I thought it said in the reading that they reject the status quo. So they don't adapt. They, they do. They, um, no, by rejecting the status quo, they are adapting. Let's see if we can come back to that. Prevention, maybe preventing something to happen. <laughs> okay. And there's one more that I would add, is that they have no fear. They have no fear. You think you can hurt me? You know what I've been through? Do you think that's going to bother me? Okay. So they have this sort of piercing sense of authenticity. They know exactly who they are. Who they, are. they can adapt to new circumstances because they had to adapt to this one. Okay? Twice-borns had to adapt to this one. They are, they're not afraid of things. They've got a supreme self-confidence. They know who they are and what they're doing and where they're going. So I'm not saying you have to have had a twice-born experience to be a leader, but I'm saying maybe it helps because the qualities you guys just described are clearly qualities of, uh, of, of leadership. You can imagine how they would contribute. So. Okay. Do that one. Well, I'll just do this one real quickly. Is that... We, we talked about this some. Can somebody be a leader in one situation and a completely different situation? And that situation might be different industries, right? So moving from the oil industry to the cosmetics industry. Um, you know, could just, just can you move? And the answer is yes. You know, you can. You can be successful. And we've seen this a lot of times. You know, somebody who was a CEO of one firm uh, that moved industries and was very successful in the other one. But it's conditioned on a few things, okay? The extent to which that leader has the technical expertise so that they can relate to the people that they're leading. Okay. So, a leader in, um, uh, let me try to think of it, in uh, a nonprofit might not do, be, do very well as the leader of a software firm, right? Because they don't have the credibility. And it also depends on who you're leading. Are they sort of a similar profile or population? Okay, so if mainly what I'm leading, let's say in a, uh, a service firm of some sort, a consultancy is pretty high-level, self-motivated professionals. And I'm good at leading them. Okay? If I move to a firm that doesn't have that, okay, doesn't have a unity, a vision, where everybody's trying to work hard and self-motivated, maybe a lot of low-level positions, um, a lot of technical positions, those are a different group, it's a different population, and I might not have the skill to bring to that population. 
So there, there's evidence that it works, it can work, but these two factors kind of contribute the extent to which it's successful. Okay. And then here's the one I really like. Is leadership a trait or a behavior? Is it something that one is, or is it something that one does? Is it a noun or a verb? By the way, I presented this, uh, uh, posed this question to a group of uh, scientists at uh, the at, um, uh, NIH. And this woman scientist, she raised her hand and she said, that's a ridiculous question. Okay, can you explain to me why you think that's ridiculous? And she said, obviously, the word leadership is a verb. Or a noun, rather. <laughs> no, she was taking scientists, right? Took it so literally um, that she couldn't quite actually get to what the question is. So, what do you think? Is leadership something you are or is it something you do? Poor guy's got to stay alert. For <laughs> can't even <laughs> write anything down or think that somebody's saying. Where's my Keep him on his toes. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I would. I don't know, I was raised, my father's actually a biologist, so I was really relating to that. Uh, I guess I would say that it's more of a behavior because human beings, as we are, we, we have a few traits that are innate in us that we're born with, but this is more of, of kind of a, a characteristic that develops out of a situation from learning, from observation. Okay from analyzing situations and okay. incorporating into it, in a, coupled with specific traits. But I would say it leans more on the behavioral side of, okay. of the spectrum. And notice how these questions are all linked in, right? It's ha hard to answer one without referring back to the others. And guess what? The, the world's a complex place. Um, but <coughs> you can't lead unless you do something, right? I mean, so it obviously has to be behavioral and base. Okay, so uh, another one over here. Where's our microphone over here? Okay. Um, you, you actually just said exactly what okay. I was going to say. So. Okay. Okay. Yet another one of these uh, discussions that could go on for a long time, and once again, trying to manage some time here. So, it depends. And so, let's step back. I mean, obviously, one argument here is that it's about a trait. Because the behavior follows the trait. Right? So you're right, it's about behavior, but primary to that in a set of causal reasoning, in a line of causal reasoning, is you've got to have the traits before you can do the behavior. So what we're going to do here is do a quick review of trait theory. Research that was done on trait theory. This is 50 years of research done on trait theory. The very best social scientific minds in the world got together to do this. And I want you to think about this for a second. If we can identify a series or a constellation of traits that can predict who's a leader and who's not a leader, it's the search for the holy grail. Imagine that situation. Okay. Bring you all in give you a series of psychological evaluations, you, 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 come with me, the rest of you, go back to work. <laughs> I've got my leaders. I've found my leaders. What an enormously powerful tool this would be. Enormously powerful tool this would be. So, 50 years of research. The idea behind these traits is that they are necessary and sufficient conditions of leadership. So you have to have them, and they're all you need. Okay. So what are some traits you associate with leadership? And as opposed to passing the microphone around, just kind of give me, give me one word with a little bit of uh, volume. Well, when you think of leaders, what do you think of? What are their skills? What are their abilities? What are their traits, their characteristics, their qualities? Empathy. Empathy. OK, what else? Motivation and drive. Motivation and drive. Good. Passion. Confidence. Passion. Confidence. Integrity. Integrity. Charisma, thank you. Attractive. Attractive? <laughs> are, you, are you paying me a compliment? <laughs> are you talking about me? Or are you? Both of us? Both of us? Both of us? <laughs> okay. Uh, meet me after class. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, um, and actually, that's quite true, and I'm going to get to that. Um, Conviction. Uh, pardon? Conviction. Conviction. Able to inspire. 
Okay, ability to inspire. Problem solvers. Problem solvers? Tough. Tough. Determining, yeah, things like that, yeah. Self-disciplined. Self-disciplined. Diplomatic. Diplomatic? Fair. 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 Okay. Fair. Persuasive. Per persuasive. Good. Okay. You're right. You're all right. Okay? I'm going to work through these. There's seven of these. The first one is so obvious that you probably didn't think about it. It's so obvious. Above average intelligence. <laughs> right? It's just one of these, it didn't even jump to your head because it's sort of a precondition. But notice, I don't say genius. Because if intelligence is a good thing, then why not more of it? Why not? Why aren't there very many geniuses among the ranks of, the, uh, of leaders? Um, relatable, being able to communicate what you want to communicate. Okay, okay, the relatability, good. Um, where's the microphone over here? Let's get it, get it moving down here. Usually, um, I feel like geniuses are, tend to be the specialists. They don't tend to be okay. you know, more in like the leadership position. Okay, all right, okay. Other thoughts about really super intelligent people? Could, could you just clarify how you're gauging intelligence here? Is this IQ based? Is yes. this based on the seven definitions of different intelligences? No, we're or, doing the straightforward IQ, which is sort of raw problem solving ability without you know the expertise and and physical intelligence, uh, uh, musical intelligence, things like that. So yes, it may have to do with passions and self-interest. So if you're okay. really good and really passionate about being a scientist, you don't want to step away and be okay. a presenter in front okay. of your organization. Okay, so part of, and part of that would be a you know a, a will issue, a motivation issue. I don't want to do that. Okay, you're, you're all right. Um, you're all correct. The problem with really smart people is they don't get why we don't get it. Some of you know really smart people. I'm talking about people in the 160 range in IQ. Everybody in this room is around 130. Okay? Everybody here is quite smart. You're all on the sweet side of the bell curve intelligence-wise. Okay? But now I'm talking about people 160 or so. They don't understand it why you don't get it. That's not going to work real well okay? for me in terms of building relationships with me. You know, they're the start to say, well, don't you just let me do it, okay? Um, and also, really intelligent people don't tend to have the best social skills. The two don't go together. There's a low correlation there, okay? So you don't need, there are a few exceptions here. Bill Clinton, who I would say was a great leader, is also a member of Mensa. He's got about 165 IQ. He has a photographic memory. Um, really, uh, just off the charts in terms of intelligence, off the charts. And he certainly had a lot of the other qualities you guys did. Well, what about people with below level intelligence? Okay, people hovering, you know, around the 75, 90 IQ, something like that. Why don't they tend to be leaders? Except in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That was good. <laughs> Not quite. It's a little, she said they don't earn the respect of their followers. I think that's true, but there's a precondition to that. There's a reason why they wouldn't. They might not have uh, technical skills that the job requires. Okay, you're getting there? It's, good. it's a little simpler than what you guys are making it out to be. They're unable to pick up the complex human interactions that a leader needs. And, and, and technical knowledge and all the rest. Look, they just don't have the mental, mental firepower to deal with highly complex issues. Okay? Um, so Forrest Gump aside, um, generally people from the lower level are not identified as leaders either. But rather, it's in that above average range, smarter than your average bear. Okay, leaders have to have enough go on up here to understand complex issues. Right? But they don't necessarily have to be a genius to do it. So, second one, excellent verbal skills. Okay, and this goes into things like inspire. To inspire you, I've got to be able to frame something in a way where it's relevant to you and it excites you okay, and animates you. If I need to persuade you, that comes from my verbal skills. Now, let me be very careful about verbal skills here. Verbal skills doesn't mean polysyllabics. <laughs> I did that intentionally. 
Um, it doesn't mean you have to have a fancy vocabulary. You can be very convincing and talk with conviction <coughs> using very simple sentences and sentence structure. It does not have to be fancy. Right? It just, just absolutely doesn't have to. Or, of course, a perfect situation is when you can use the sophisticated language talking to this audience, and you can use the folksier, straightforward language talking to this one. Those are excellent verbal skills, right? right? Another thing that Clinton was absolutely a genius with, he could talk to any sophisticated policy audience and knew more about it than they knew, and then he could go down to Arkansas, all of a sudden the accent came back, he's Bubba again. Okay? <laughs> he was really, really good at doing that. By the way, that's part of the reason why we didn't trust the man because Bill Clinton had what's called borderline personality disorder, <laughs> which means he had no core self. You never knew which Bill Clinton you were going to get. And people that worked for him said that. You never knew what person he was going to be. He was like, you know, he was 10 different people and it depended on which one he pulled out at that moment. So no core self, and that led a lot of us to not trust him. So, um, oh, but just speaking of excellent verbal skills in Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton's got three quotes in Bartlett's book of quotations. The first, I did not inhale. <laughs> the second, I did not have sex with that woman. And the third, I love this one, it depends on what the mania is. is. <laughs> okay. Now here's a guy with outstanding verbal skills who is very attuned to the fact that he was in the spotlight and he still said those things. Okay, he's a classic example of somebody who was his own worst enemy. Um, he just thought he was too smart and the rules of life didn't necessarily apply to him. So, so, excellent verbal skills, makes perfect sense. Missions, visions, all the rest of this stuff needs to be communicated. Third, excellent conceptual skills. Leaders are conceptual thinkers. Now, the way to think about this, the way for me to describe this, is in the difference between concrete thinkers and abstract thinkers. Okay? A concrete thinker needs the thing in front of them in order to think about it. An abstract thinker takes the thing in and puts it in their head, and now can do all sorts of things with it. They're not bound by the laws of gravity and reality. Because they're an abstract thinker, a conceptual thinker. Why is that important for leaders? That would drive innovation and creativity? That's it. Okay, that's it. To be creative, to be innovative, is to see something that doesn't exist. Right? To see something that doesn't exist. That requires skills that are, an, that are cognitive and orientation and which frees you from reality. What's here now? Concrete thinkers can only do, deal with things that exist. Abstract thinkers can take that aside, be creative, be innovative, visions, missions, all these exciting things. Now combine that with their verbal skills, you've got some power. You still see? Say uh, to be able to reflect. Yes, right, to live, a, live an internal life, to understand what's gone on and why it's gone on, even if there's not objective data for it. Okay. Good, four. Extroverted, okay. Now, how many of you have taken the Myers-Briggs? Okay, all right. You're not gonna like me. You're not going to like me for the next couple moments, but the Myers-Briggs is a piece of crap. Yes, yes, thank you. It's an utter piece of crap. It's a horoscope. Okay, ooh, I'm an ENTJ. I have no idea what that means. Okay, and particularly, particularly uh, um, uh, damaging about this is their definition of extroversion. To them, extroversion is you derive energy from a social situation. Where what extroversion really is, and there's tons of research on this, is extroverts are socially attuned. Extroverts are people that are paying attention to the people around them. That's what extroversion is. As a matter of fact, you know those loud, obnoxious people? Little overly friendly, slap you on the back, okay? Those are introverts. They don't realize 
that they're offending people or putting people off. They'll, they'll, they'll invade your personal space distance and they don't notice it because they're not paying attention. Is this making you uncomfortable? Yeah, yeah I thought so. Um, so those are, most of those people are introverts. You can be a quiet extrovert. You can be a quiet extrovert. Um, so extroversion does not mean this constant talking and engagement and garrulousness. Extroversion means being socially attuned. It's situation sensing skill is what extroversion brings you. So why is the Myers-Briggs so popular? Um, why, are, why do people read their horoscopes every day? Well, even the school used it when we first came in. I know. <laughs> they didn't, don't ask me about this stuff. So why is it so popular? Because it helps to reinforce to us what we think we are. Right? And it's broad enough that it allows us to read anything into it. Um, something I used to do with classes, maybe I ought to do it with you guys uh, two weeks from now, although this will ruin it, is I'll come in and say, hey, here's the horoscope for Capricorn. Right? Let me, any Capricorns in the room? Yeah, there's a couple. All right, does this actually, let me read this. Does this actually describe this month for you? Oh, yeah, exactly. Well, too bad, because that was the horoscope for Sagittarius, fool. Um, <laughs> the the, the, the Myers-Briggs allows you to read all this stuff in. And so people like it, and they want to take it, and the Center for uh, Creative Leadership makes a lot of money on it. And so they market the thing really well. Um, so. Dominant, assertive, or presence. Now, you normally think of dominant as somebody who's loud and commanding and bangs their fist on the table, but once again, you can be quietly dominant. As a matter of fact, you've experienced this, haven't you? You've been in a room with somebody who doesn't say hardly anything, but they're the dominant person in the room. Okay? Everybody knows it. Okay? They've got a presence about them carriage about them that just draws you to them, a gravitas that's hard to understand. If we were to put a different word on this, we would call it charisma. Charisma. Okay. I can't explain it to you, okay. but I know it. Not when I see it, I know it when I feel it. And you've felt it before. You've felt charisma before. Again, could be a quiet person, could be a loud person, could be outgoing, but you've felt it before. Okay? That's what it is. It's a guttural reaction. Okay? If I could explain it more than that, maybe I could actually then measure it. If I could measure it, I could bottle it. If I could bottle it, I would be very, very rich. <laughs> but I'm not. I had the good fortune to meet Mother <coughs> Teresa once. Okay? Mother Teresa is about 4 foot 10 inches tall, weighs about 75 pounds, soaking wet. Okay? And when I met her, she keeps her head down, always in a supplicant position. When I met her, my knees were trembling. My whole body was trembling. Right? There was just something. There was a presence that she, she had. And charism actually means touched with the oil of God. Um, and she had it. Okay? You know, whatever it is, she had it. Um, so I wish I could explain it more, but this tends to be a quality of outstanding leadership. Yeah. I know this is going to be an outlier example, but every so often I feel like we encounter people who don't even even they're not even quietly dominant. They're just people are drawn to them and they want to follow them because of the genuine nature of who they are. Okay. And it strikes me that they they don't they're not necessarily dominant or assertive in any way, but yet we would see them as a leader because we want to follow them. Yeah, but I mean, I would say that that is a kind of dominance. Here they are, they're directing your behavior in a way. They're, you're drawn to them like, you know, like a gravitational force. And so they are being dominant. They do have this presence. So yeah, we're might, maybe we're just, we're, we might just be, uh, th this might be just no, um, you know, semantics that we're talking about. But I would argue that that actually describes exactly uh, what it's about. unintentional. Even if it's unintentional. Yeah, even if it's unintentional. A high energy level. Now, people talk about persistence, you know, and things like this. Um, now, let, let me be clear. I'm not saying that to be a good leader, you have to be a spaz and bounce off the walls like I did. Okay? You can, once again, assert a level-headed, methodical, steady level of energy. Okay? Remember, emotions are infectious. So if I'm energetic, you're picking up my energy. 
So I'm helping you work more and work better by having a high energy level. It means that I can stick on things and persevere and don't give up on them. That means that you see that I don't give up on things. And if you're, and because I'm in the spotlight and if you're role modeling me, you say, okay, I'm not giving up either. So there's all sorts of positive elements that attend to high energy level. Once again, I'm not talking crazy, I'm not talking off the charts or anything nuts like that. I'm just saying that we want our leaders to be energetic, we admire it, and it has effects on us even beyond our conscious awareness. This, by the way, is why I've developed this style of teaching. Because part of what I need to do, especially in long programs, right, is I need to keep you awake. And my energy helps to do that. The fact that I move around a lot, I use a lot of gesticulation, I use humor, I use all these sorts of things, helps keep you with me. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So is high energy level always sort of a relative measurement in that case? Because you could be I think, you know, a leader of monks who are very quiet and low energy, but yeah. you could be have very minimal absolute yeah. energy. I think once again, we've got a situational issue here. You know, that what, what's proper for that particular context. And then conflict. Um, doesn't mean you don't have self-doubt. Look, I, I think Woody Allen's funny. But I don't want to follow him. Because he's nothing but self-doubt, right? He's nothing but anxiety and uncertainty, debilitating most of the time. Why, why are you asking me? I have no idea what to do. It's funny. Okay, I love, uh, I love neuroses, um, but it doesn't inspire confidence in me, and that's what confidence does. That's the effect it has. If I have confidence, that helps inspire it in you. He's experienced, he's been around the block, he's A, B, and C, he's articulate, he's all these other things. He feels this is the way to go, I'm buying in. Okay, I'm buying in. So, yeah? How does this compare to your neighbors that seem to have um, I, I didn't. Um, I didn't say that they. Uh, oh, but I guess I don't need that. <laughs> um, um, I didn't say they were extroverted. I didn't say anything about their conceptual skills. I just said sort of physically and their household and stuff was perfect. So, um, but okay. So guess what? Fifty years of research, and what did we find? That these are neither necessary or sufficient. There are people out there that are clearly identified with leaders as leaders, and yet they don't have some of these qualifications or qualities rather. And there are other people out there that have them in abundance, but in no way, shape, or form would ever be capable of leading. Oh my God, fifty years. So what do we do now? We keep moving on, and we look at behavior theory. So this is the action part. So after doing a lot of research, these are called the University of Michigan and the Ohio State studies because they were being done continuously, um, or simultaneously rather, at those two institutions. And they came to the conclusion that pretty much everything you do during the course of your day has one of two effects. It either initiates structure or it initiates consideration. Initiating structure means it's task-oriented behaviors, right? Deadlines, getting things done, logistics, execution. Just think of initiating structure as, as job, task-related activities. And initiating consideration are more people behavior, right? It's more of a concern for others, conflict resolution. It's a whole series of things like that. So now we put them in a two-by-two two table. All bow to the two-by-two two table. <laughs> when you get a doctorate, you are required to use a two-by-two two table at every possible opportunity. I don't care how complex the phenomena is, it must be represented in a two-by-two two table. Okay. So, anyway. <laughs> so, here we have somebody who's high in initiating structure, gets the job done, and high in initiating consideration. They care about you, and they get the job done. We call this a team leader, right? This is great. This is who you want to work for. Have any of you ever worked for this person? <laughs> okay, guess not. Um, we'll move over to the other one. Okay, high in initiating structure, so gets the job done, but low in initiating consideration. We call that authority leadership. So here's the leader that says, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear about it. Get it done now. 
Have any of you ever worked for this person? Are any of you this person? <laughs> actually, that's good. Some people are actually shaking their heads going, yeah, that's me. Um, okay, here's somebody who's low in initiating structure, so doesn't get the job done, doesn't attend to all the task-oriented behaviors, but is high in initiating consideration, so it really cares about people. So we call this country club membership, or a country club uh, uh, management, because everybody's happy, but nothing gets done. Okay, and then finally, somebody low in both, uh, impoverished management. Um, so um, uh, you know, they're not doing anything here. Some of you have probably worked for this person as well. Okay. The problem when all this got done is it did a beautiful job describing management, but not necessarily leadership. See where I'm going here? I want to work for this person. They care about me, and they get the job done. That doesn't mean I've chosen them as my leader. Right. Okay. So it describes management beautifully, but not so much leadership because it doesn't include these things that we've been talking about, like passion and, and uh, creativity and inspiration and guidance and all the rest of this. Doesn't quite capture those things. Yeah. A lot of the research I've seen. Uh, a lot of the research I've seen on leadership <laughs> makes it sound extremely complex. Um, could it also be that leadership can just be simple? Like, I, I haven't seen anything yet that just said leadership can be just logical, a person that thinks objectively and not easily influenced. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the better you can try to capture it in elegant ways like that, good for you. And I do think there's a lot of popular leadership books out there that have basically done something like this. They've said, oh, this is very simple. Here's five principles. Then they write another, you know, uh, 200 pages that basically mean nothing, right? The first chapter outlining the five principles, the rest of it is just reinforcing what the first chapter said. They sell a lot of books because we like it, and then we go to the next leadership book that comes after that. Um, so I think the reason why those are fads and fashions is because they're not true. They are true, but they're not the whole picture. And obviously, for the purposes of this class, I'm intentionally complicating things, right? I'm trying to get you to think about it in all these different ways in your own assumptions. So that's part of what the point of the class is. Um, it's not reading a book that you picked up at the airport. Okay. Um, Colin Powell, his uh, 10 Rules of Leadership are really terrific, but they're kind of common sense. You know, leadership is not a popularity contest. Well, okay, I get it. You know, it's about people respecting you, not liking you, but that doesn't really help me be a better leader. It helps me understand something about it. So, um, okay, so now we're here. This difference between leadership and management. Now, I want to make this very clear. I'm not talking about the difference between leaders and managers in the way that it's a Lancet. Yeah. I'm not talking about people here, because somebody can be an outstanding leader and an outstanding manager, right? Somebody can be an outstanding leader and a terrible manager, okay, like Richard Branson. Okay. Somebody can be a lousy uh, leader and a great manager, and somebody can be lousy at both. Okay. I'm talking about the functions of leadership and management, the functions of them. Okay. So what I want you to do is try to, I'm going to give you about two minutes here, try to come up with an analogy or two to this sentence. Okay. Leadership is to blank as management is to blank. And here's an example. Leadership is to direction as management is to execution. This is the complementary nature of these functions and organizations. So we're not going to do the discuss with two people because we don't have quite time to do this. But spend a minute or two. Try to come up with a few of these. Um, one, maybe two of them. You don't have to think about business dynamics. Get out of it. Think about music. Think about art. Um, think about gardening, you know, whatever it happens to be, architecture. Excuse me. Um, so, you know, op open your mind up a little bit and try to capture this relationship in one or two analogies. So I'm just going to give you about two minutes for this. 